Good morning, everybody. Um, you might be expecting Lisa Mason Ziegler right now, but it's Lisa's day off. So my name is Dave Dowling, and I'll be filling in for Lisa today for the Ask the Farmer, pretty much anything. Um, you can ask me about how to grow things, how to order things, whatever you want to ask. Um, when you do want to ask a question at the bottom right of your screen, there's a little bubble with a question mark. Just click on that and then type in your question, and I'll answer the questions in a few minutes. Um, just a quick background on me. Uh, again, my name is Dave Dowling. I had a cut flower farm in Maryland for 20 years. Closed the farm back in early 2012, I think it is. I've lost track, maybe 2013. And I went to work for Edney Flower Bulbs, which is in New Jersey. So I moved up there, worked for them for seven years. After about five years, Edney sold to the Fred C. Glockner Company. So then I was able to sell both bulbs and plugs and seeds and other cut flower supply stuff to cut flower growers all around the country. And then about a year and a half ago, um, it was December 1st of 2021. Nope, December 1st of 2022, 2020, the COVID year. December 1st of the year 2020, Glockner wanted to retire, the owner did. And so he sold the company to Ball Horticulture or Ball Seed and also known as Ball Colorlink, which is who I work for. I went to work for uh, Ball Colorlink as a, what they call an account development rep, basically working with small to mini, medium-sized customers all across the country, across the U.S. Um, and I work only with cut flower growers. So I have a few customers that might grow a few other bedding plants and things, but most of them are just cut flower growers. Um, but it's all under the umbrella of the Colorlink sales office which is part of Ball that works with the smaller customers. So if you don't have an account with Ball yet, what you do is you call the Colorlink office. They can set you up with an account over the phone, and then you can place orders through them or using what we have online system called WebTrack, which is an online customer portal where you can place orders, check on orders, check on tracking. WebTrack can seem a little confusing at first, but once you figure it out, it's not that difficult. It, it just has a lot of information available to you. But you'll call the Color Link office at 800 686 7380 and they can set up an account for you over the phone. It is for commercial only. We don't sell to backyard gardeners or home gardeners. It's for people who are growing cut flowers to resell as a, you know, a, a, growing the plants to sell cut flowers. Um, I've known Lisa for, I think it's going on close to 20, almost 25 years, 22 or 23. Um, and I did, it's been three years ago, started the online class, Bob's Woody's Perennials and More, which is kind of the second step up if you've taken Lisa's course, it's just a basic cut flower growing, mostly annuals and setting up the business correctly. Um, that class is only available once a year. Both of us do them once a year. Lisa's, um, the class starts in early November and usually register in September. I don't have the dates in front of me, but it'll be on the gardenersworkshop.com website. My class is always the first, starts the second week of July, so it just ended for this year. The next opportunity would be for next year. You register in June for the class to start in July. So let's see what kind of questions we have starting up here already. Um, Pink Petal Company wants to know, what cool flowers can I direct sow now in Zone 8? Um, it's almost a little early in Zone 8 because you still have a lot of hot weather going on, you usually want to start direct sowing about six to eight weeks before your first fall frost. So I'm guessing in zone eight, you probably don't get a frost until sometime in November. So count back from that eight weeks and that's when you start to do in the direct zone. Um, but things like Bupleurum, Bachelor Buttons, Larkspur, um, Poppies, anything that you can direct sow, you do it about eight weeks, six to eight weeks before your first fall frost. But my most important thing is you have to water those seeds. You can't put them out there, water them today, and then walk away the day after you plant them and hope they grow. You need to go out there and, and water those lightly almost every day until they're up and growing and even st still water them until they're a little bit established. Uh, it sees too many people go out and plant a field of larkspur and then wonder why they didn't grow and didn't germinate. Well, they watered them one time and walked away and that just doesn't work. Same thing if you're doing planted um, Cool, cool season plants putting in plugs in the fall. You got to water them. You can't just put them out there and hope they'd survive on their own. Um, Sisters in the Garden wants to know, can I 
tell me where I can find info on what crops absolutely have to be rotated and other that can stay put in the same spot as the year before. Notice the idea is you want to rotate your crops so it helps eliminate or reduce the instances of disease and insects. I mean, you think something like, I know I had terrible uh, squash beetles this year or squash bugs. It destroyed my squash plants because I planted them in the same spot they were last year. I had a few squash bugs last year. They left their eggs in the soil and they came back this year with inventions and literally in a week my plants were all dead because the squash bugs were so bad. Now, if I planted those plants 50 feet away, they might have been fine. So that's why you rotate is for both insect and disease. Um, things like tulips should always be rotated and they say not to go back for another six or seven years to the same spot because you'll get tulip fire, which is basically where the plants rot and get botrytis and just destroy the plants. Um, the only plants that I would not rotate or you don't think about rotating is perennials, but any annual crop, you should always rotate it. So the sunflower should go into a different bed next year, the celosias, cosmos, ageratum, everything in a new spot every year. Um, if you're planting in an open field and you always started in the first row, if you just next year start over five rows and then that automatically ends up rotating the crops without even having to think about it that much because what was in that first row last year is now five rows over. And then you just work your way across the field and then come back to the beginning. Um, it doesn't take a fancy spreadsheet or a lot of planning to do it. Um, just gotta remember, okay, here's where I had the sunflowers this year. I wanna move them to a new spot next year. Um, but any annual crop, you should definitely always try and rotate it to a new spot. Uh, room for flowers wants to know about snapdragons, the groups of snapdragons. That can always be so confusing. Um, any cut flower snapdragon usually has a number one, two, three, or four after the name. Sometimes it's the Roman numeral, sometimes it's the English number. Um, and that number pertains to when that flower is going to bloom, not when you plant it. So a group one is going to bloom in the winter time. So it's going to bloom December, January, and February, maybe early March. Um, so you're going to plant that 10, 12 weeks before that. So you'd be planting that group one snapdragon in late September to bloom in December and January. So it's a group one pertains to winter blooming, and that's when you want to have that variety blooms. So you're going to plant it six, eight weeks before that. A group four is for the hot summer. They can take the longer days of summer, more light, short nights, and the high temperatures. But those, again, you don't plant those in June. You plant them back in April to bloom in June and July. And then the three and four are the shoulder season, spring and fall. Um, they're pretty much interchangeable. So if you have a group three, I mean, a group three or a group two, they can plant them to bloom in April, May, or October, November. Um, and a lot of the snapdragons will have a two group numbers. It might say Potomac uh, three, four, which means it'll work in the shoulder seasons of spring and fall and also in the summer. But something that's just Potomac four should only try and grow that in the summer because it's not gonna produce in early spring or it's definitely not in the greenhouse in the wintertime because the days are too short and they need the long days of summer. There's some snapdragons that don't have a group number on them sometimes. Rocket often doesn't have a group number, but it's usually a group four. And then Chantilly and Madame Butterfly, the open-faced snapdragons, they usually don't have a number on them, but we know that they're groups twos and threes, so they can usually do the spring and fall shoulder seasons. But you can definitely grow snapdragons in the summer heat. You want to go for Potomac and Opus are two of the ones that love the heat, and also the rockets will work in the summer. Rockets are shorter, only about 30 inches. Potomac and Opus, they can get to be four feet tall. So you definitely need to have support netting on those. Um, so I'm just know how to prepare new flower beds for fall or spring planting, how to size the beds. Um, well, to prepare them, it depends what's there already. If you're talking a field that's been a hay field for years or horse pasture, you wanna be able to get rid of the whatever's growing already, whether it's grass or weeds, by mowing it down, tilling it in, covering with a tarp to kill it off. Just know that whenever you start a new bed, there's literally millions of weed seeds already there. And the only way to get rid of those is let them grow and kill them as they grow. Um, so that's why you often we use row cover over the, uh, not row cover, plastic mulch on the beds itself and weed fabric between the beds in the walkways, or even sometimes people grow in the weed fabric where they then cut the holes to uh, plant in those. Um, but then you usually, if you're planting 
uh, prepping a bed for the first time, you're going to have to do some kind of uh, mechanical tillage, whether it's with a tiller, with a broad fork, taking a shovel and digging it and flipping it over and chopping it up with the shovel to loosen the soil up. Um, so you just got to work the bed like that. Add in compost, organic material, which really helps the soil. Um, if you're adding any uh, fertilizer, add that when you're prepping the bed. And then the most important question is how to size the beds. Um, always recommend that if you have the opportunity to make all your beds the same size in your farm, I recommend doing that. So the, the piece of drip tape you use this year on the first bed will fit the 50th bed. So it's always all the same. Um, if you're using support netting, the same piece of netting will fit any bed you have. As soon as you have beds that are somewhere two feet wide and 20 feet long and 50 feet long, every year you have to say, okay, which piece of drip tape or which piece of support netting is going to fit on that bed? Um, so you want to aim to have all your beds the same width and the same length. I always like the 30 or 36 inch wide because you can reach the center of the bed easily. If you do a bed that's four feet wide and it's a bed of lysianthus, I can guarantee you no matter how tall or how short you are, you can have difficulty reaching the center of that bed to pick the flowers in the middle. So that a 30 to 36 inch bed width is what I felt was the best. Um, length, it depends on the size of your farm. 50 is a good length. A lot of people do 75 or 100. Just know that if you have a really long bed, that means you have to walk the full length of that bed to get to the other side. If you have a 50 foot bed, it's only, a, you know, if you're, if you're in the middle of the row, it's only a 50 foot walk to get to the other side of the bed. If you have a 100 foot long bed, it's a much longer walk to either get to the other side of the bed, to get to the next bed, or to carry out those buckets of flowers. So to me, I think the 50 to 75 foot length is good, but you can always do longer if you have room for it. Um, somebody wants to know, what's the best size pot to order when you're ordering perennials? Um, you're probably talking about ordering what size liners, which a liner is basically a rooted cutting, which is what most perennials come as, whether it's flocks or sedum or something else. It's a cutting that's been rooted into a plug tray that's um, called a liner because they're grown from cuttings. Um, a 50 or 72, sometimes you get as, as small as a 120. And the 120 tells you there's 120 plants in that tray, but that's getting to be a pretty small plant to have 120 perennials in one tray. So usually it's 50 or 72. Um, there are some perennial suppliers that do as small as a size 21 or as large as a 21, the lowest number of 21, but a, a larger plug. Um, a lot of places do the 32 where it's basically a two and a half inch pot. The important thing to know is when you plant new perennials, if you plant them in the spring, you might not get production off of them that first year. And they may bloom, but not be as tall and as robust as a plant that was planted the year before. So there's still time to plant perennials now in August and September in pretty much any zone anywhere. Take care of them, keep them watered and weeded this fall. And then next spring, you'll have a full size plant. I'm talking things like stock, not stock, um, sedum, phlox, gooseneck loosestrife, achillea, any of those. If you plant a, a 50 cell tray, size plant today or this fall, which that plant's about an inch and a quarter by inch and a quarter cube and use about an inch and a half deep. That plant looks small right now, planting it in the field, but next spring you'll have a full size plant with lots of flowers to pick off of it. You have to do now go to the next questions. Um, Lots of questions now. Hang on a second. Uh, Virginia says, growing raised beds that are 17 inches tall. How can I protect them this winter? Zone 8, Pacific Northwest. Um, if you're talking protecting them to overwinter, like hardy, cool flowers, um, in Zone 8, you shouldn't need to protect them from anything. It's pretty warm there. Um, it's only if you're in a colder zone, like 7 or especially 6 and 5, where it's really cold. If you have a raised bed that's eight, 17 inches tall, if you raise that with like a two by 10 piece of wood, it's gonna freeze and thaw on the edges every day. If it's with timbers, you know, a four by four or a six by six, you, you should be fine planting all the way to the edge of the bed. But in zone eight, you shouldn't have to protect it from anything except for possibly in, uh, predators, deer and things like that. But as far as temperature wise, it should be fine. Uh, Tracy has, she's in 5B, a bunch of lupine seeds. Does she transplant 
or direct sow and should I treat as a cool flower established in spring? You could plant them, get them started and do them as a transplant this fall or do them in very early spring um, where you'd be starting them a good six or eight weeks before your last frost to get them started as a plant that you would then transplant out while it's still light frost in the fall, light frost in the spring. What advice for planting and growing hellebores? Um, hellebore are a lot like a peony. They're a slow to get established. So if you plant a plant this fall or early next spring, it might be two or three years before you get a lot of flowers out of them. Um, but the trick is just getting the varieties that you want and getting the plants in your hands to be able to plant them in the garden. Some of the newer hybridized varieties are actually grown from tissue culture. So it's a two year process to produce that plant, which two things, it makes a plant more expensive, two or $3 per plant. Um, as opposed to some of the more open pollinated ones that have been around for years. <clears throat> but the trick is get your order in as soon as possible so you get what you want. Um, they do like shade. They like really um, humus soil, lots of compost. Um, if you've ever seen Lisa Ziegler has her patch of the underneath for a magnolia tree and they just get buried in leaves. They grow through the leaves and the leaves stay there as mulch and it, they reseed and do amazing there under the shade of the big magnolia tree. Um, old Al Hala Farm had the worst time with the cosmos. She deadheaded and have irrigation zone eight, nine A. Couldn't get in the taller than a foot and they all died. You're probably growing the wrong variety. Um, varieties to grow are the double click cosmos, Versailles, like the museum in France, um, cupcake. You don't want to do sensation. Sensation is a, doesn't bloom till the fall. Um, I like to plant the cosmos, start them as a transplant, so start them in a plug tray. Very easy to start your own. You can start them on a picnic table or under a, a light rack if you're doing them that way. Transplant them out in about a week to 10 days. Pinch the top out. They'll be about maybe 10 inches tall. Pinch out the top. Make sure you have really secure support netting because they're going to be big and heavy. And then they're going to grow, branch out, and you'll have plants that are five feet tall with dozens and dozens of flowers. Um, you mentioned you're deadheaded. That's really important to know that you're picking a flower that's about to open that day. You never want to pick an open cosmos. It should be a bud about to pop open. So you would go out this afternoon and deadhead every, every flower you have. And then you know tomorrow morning the ones that are just popping open are the ones that you want to pick. But if they're only growing a foot tall, that seems like you have the wrong variety. Um, it's, whenever you're buying seeds or plants for cut flowers, it's really important to read the description really well because a lot of the new breeding and plants, whether it's perennials or annuals, they want short and stocky, which is not what you want for a cut flower. You want tall and gangly, as tall as you can get. So there are cosmos out there that grow to be a foot tall. So you may have just had the wrong variety. No matter how much fertilizer or water you do, it's just not gonna, it's gonna work. Uh, Room for Flowers says, a lot of seed packets have a lot of info on them, but doesn't always consider where you live. Um, how can I figure out when to plant for my area? Um, you got to think you have basically several different kinds of plants. You have the ones that are the heat loving things like zinnias and cos uh, zinnias and celosia, um, gumfrina that just loves the heat and you can't plant them when it's cold, cold ground or a chance to frost. So those you don't want to start until after it's warmed up. Um, then you get the ones like the cool flowers that don't mind it chilly that you can either start them in the fall if they'll ever winter in your area if you're zone five or warmer or very late winter where you'd be planting them in sometime in March probably. Um, so it depends on where you're located. If it's a heat loving plant, not until after your last frost date. If it's a cool flower, early spring or in the fall, if it's the kind of overwinter. Uh, Southern Bell Blooms wants to know, is planting three to five I peony roots this fall. When do you recommend amending this? What would I recommend amending the soil with? and what practices are essential for planting large numbers of peonies. Um, amend the soil with compost, use potting soil, anything to loosen up the soil. Um, it depends where you're at, what your soil is like to begin with. Some places have just great soil to begin with. Some are, you know, the, the farm you can make bricks with the clay that's out in the field. So you want to make sure the soil is amended so it's, it's uh, loosened up and has lots of organic material in it. Um, and when you're doing that, you don't have to amend the whole field because you if you there's no reason to spend that time and effort amending soil that you're going to walk on for the next 20 or 30 years between your peonies so just amend the soil in the areas of the field that are going to have the actual peony plants in it um, and don't waste that 
valuable resource of that good compost in the aisles where you're just going to walk on it for the next 30 years. Um, and one of the best practices, what practices are essential for planting large numbers of peonies? A strong back and ability to dig nice deep holes. Um, you want to make sure that you plant them so the eyes are two inches below the surface, um, pack the soil around them, water them really good, and then water them again tomorrow, the next day, to make sure the soil is settled in really good around the roots. You might find some that they came to the surface and you got to push them back in, or you might need to add more soil to them if the uh, soil settled too much. But the planting them two inches deep where the eyes are two inches below the surface is very important for peonies. And then I also highly recommend having a weed program in place before you plant the peonies because they're going to, the peony plants are there for years and you don't want the weeds taken over because once the weeds take over the peony patch, it's very difficult to clean it up in the future. So I recommend planting peonies on the black landscape fabric, both in the aisles and where you're putting the plants. And instead of burning a big foot diameter hole for the plants, I like to cut an X so those flaps so the fabric go back down and help keep the weeds out. Then also always warn people that if you're putting out landscape fabric in the fall and you staple it down with those shiny metal staples on freshly worked soil, it's going to blow away in the wintertime. So always make sure that you put bags of rocks, cinder blocks, lumber, something around the edges and on the seams of that fabric so it does not blow away in the winter. Um, after the first two years, it'll stay in place after that. Just that first winter or two, you risk the chance of the fabric blowing away or blowing off the bed. And it's very difficult, nearly impossible, to get that fabric to line back up with those plants. Uh, Muddy and Rue says, their snapdragons have already gone to sea, but I've noticed the tops of the flowers have started to bloom again. Could I get another harvest if I mow or prune them down the plants? Um, like I mentioned earlier, the, the snapdragons have groups. So it's important to know that you're, what group you have. It would be very difficult to get a group one to bloom in September and October. I'm sorry, not one, a group four, the summer snapdragon to bloom in September and October. If that's a group three, four, you'd probably be okay doing it where you would then prune it down and get the branch back out. It's about six or eight weeks before they bloom again. But this is where if you, when you harvest your snapdragons, you're cutting those first stems, harvest them and leave about a two inch stump. Don't leave a, a foot long branch still or, or plant still on the bed because that's going to give you 20 little short stems with little small flowers. If when you harvest them the first time, you leave that one inch stump, you might get three or four new sprouts that come up. Those sprouts are maybe 18 or 20 inches tall and they make a usable plant a good flower. Uh, here's somebody asking the same kind of question. Can I get a second bloom of snapdragons in August and September if I cut back and fertilize? You don't want to have to cut back afterwards. You want to cut back as you harvest and that gets right away gets that plant starting to put out the new stems. So don't go back and give it all a haircut at once. You want to actually pick every bloom, cut that stem down to the one inch height so you get a regrowth from that. I mentioned you fertilize. Yes, I recommend you fertilize or whatever you use, give them something. I don't care if it's organic or uh, commercial. Just give them some fertilizer because they've pretty much eaten everything they could reach from that first flush of flowers and growth. So you need to give them some more fertilizer. Uh, Southern Bell Blooms, much enough, there's still peony ranunculus available to order on um, what's the minimum per variety. There are still peonies available from Edney and ranunculus. Um, both those you would order through Ball Color Link. Uh, but the actual product comes from Edney. The peonies, they still have, I want to say it's, I checked the other day, 10,000 available. There's still a lot available. Um, peonies are sold in multiples of 25, unless it's a expensive variety that's over $14 each, and then there are multiples of 10. And for the ranunculus, you have to buy in multiples of 100, um, and you get a price break if you get 500 of the same variety. Um, so if you just contact the ColorLink office, they can actually give you an availability list, um, and help you place an order. But you would call them at 800-686-7380. What's the best way to get to get wholesale pricing? I want to make sure I'm being fair to myself and my buyers. Oh, but what is the best way to set wholesale pricing? So you're talking about selling your pricing, wholesale pricing for your flowers that you're selling to florist. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. The ASCFG, if you're a member of the association, especially cut flower growers, in the members only section, there's a, a pricing guideline where people have sent in their prices. And it's basically just a big spreadsheet where it lists what people are selling it for 
directly to the consumer at the farmer's market, directly to the florist, and also directly to a wholesaler who then resells it to the florist. Um, it's not a whole lot of information there, but it's a, a starting point. Um, then there's also things called the Boston Terminal Market. If you just Google Boston Terminal Market Ornamentals, I think is what it's under, um, it gives you a weekly list of the prices of the cut flowers from the wholesaler in in Boston. And they use that as a starting point because even if they're selling something and their Lysianthus is $15 a bunch, if that's going to lose money for you, you can't sell it for $15 a bunch. So you have to take into what into consideration what it costs you to grow it and also what your local market will pay. Because if you're selling in New York City, that's very different than in some little country, some little city in the middle of Kansas or Oklahoma. Um, so you got to go by what it costs you to grow it. That's the most important consideration when setting your prices. Um, and then go with what the local uh, local area will pay. What are the reasons for a cosmos growing but not blooming? You probably have the variety called sensation, which doesn't bloom until the days get shorter in September. So give it three or four more weeks and you have beautiful flowers up around the frost, the time of frost, late September and then into October. So don't grow the variety called sensation, grow Versailles, Double click, cupcake, ones like that. Oh, I lost my questions. Hang on a second, I gotta scroll through them again. Oh, Al, Al Hollow Farm is asking, when you use landscape cloth and you're cutting the holes or the axis, you just lift it and then mend soil? If so, how often? No, if you're putting on landscape fabric for a perennial or something like peonies, you get that soil as good as you can get it before you put that fabric down, and then you're done. You don't do any more amending, no more anything. Then you would add fertilizer in future years, but you're done with amending that soil. So if you're going to put down landscape fabric on a long-term perennial, like you know, uh, phlox or peonies, you do all the amending you can beforehand because once you cover that fabric, it stays on there forever. Now, if you're using fabric for annuals or something that you're going to change every year, then you amend it before you put it down in the spring. When you take it up in the fall, you can amend again in the fall or again in the next spring before you cover it again. But once that fabric's down, you don't lift it up to amend it. You've already done all that amending beforehand. This is a, a farmer or a home gardener who was surprised to hear about the rotating the flowers. Um, they're in Michigan, they're doing begonias and patients, zinnias and the same spot every year without issue. Do you need to be concerned? You may have a problem at some point. Um, it's been 10 or 12 years ago where in patients all of a sudden started getting downy mildew and they just melted in place. They might have planted them in May and they looked great until second week of June and they just literally rotted away in a, in a week's time. And that's partially from not rotating. Um, so it is a good idea to rotate even in your home garden. Uh, Jory John wants to know if daffodils can be interplanted with peonies. Yes, you can, because they bloom a little bit before the peonies. That's fine. Uh, Some of us know how, when you buy a peony from the garden center, how do you know how old they are? Can you plant them right away and harvest them that same year? Um, you can look at how many sprouts are coming out of the pot. If there's only one or two, maybe three, it was a two to three eye plant when they planted. If it's got four or five stems, it was a three to five eye plant. Some garden centers will plant them in the fall and sell them right away the next spring. Some plant them and wait two years before they sell them. It's a much bigger plant. Um, you can definitely plant them right away, no matter when you buy them, whether you buy them in May and June when they're in flower or buy them on sale in September at the end of the year. Definitely plant them right away. Make sure you keep them weeded and watered. And then the question is, can you harvest them the, them the same year? For me with peonies, you can harvest them as long as when you're taking that flower, you're still leaving lots of leaves on the plant. So if you were to buy a peony from a garden center that has two stems and only has one flower, no, you should not harvest that stem because you're not leaving enough leaves to regenerate the root for next year. So as long as you can pick that flower and still leave lots of leaves, go for it. I like to say if, if you were to cut your flowers and it still looked like the plant was all still there, then yes, go ahead and pick it. Otherwise, wait until the plant is bigger. Uh, Muddy Muckers wants to know, as a new flower farmer, any advice on types and varieties and colors of tulips and daffodils? 
trying to make trying to keep it simple and not overwhelming. Um, for the tulips, I recommend doubles and parrots and fringed. Fringed are the ones kind of like the serrated le- edges, like a feather. The reason for that is because you can always find cheap single tulips at the wholesaler, at the grocery store, at Whole Foods, Trader Joe's in the spring, really cheap. But they rarely have the neat looking, the special parrots and doubles and fringe. So for, the, for those, I go with that. As far as colors, there's no such thing as a bad color of tulip. Um, orange, yellow, pink, purple, they're all fine. Um, and same thing with daffodils. To go for the doubles, the interesting color combinations. Don't do just the basic plain yellow trumpet daffodil. Um, Hunt Country Flowers says, how can I plant up my last succession plant of warm season plants in late July in the black landscape fabric and get them to live? The watered before planting and hand watered afterwards. They're in zone seven. My guess is that the landscape fabric isn't as bad as landscape plastic. Often with the landscape plastic, you'll have it's so hot and sunny that if a young seedling is touching that fabric and the sun shines, it's going to basically cauterize or cook the stem right there and kill it. So it's important to water the plants before you transplant, water the soil really well so it's nice and damp because that also keeps down the temperature of the fabric of the plastic. Um, but water is the key thing. Um, if you can water before a cloudy day, that's also helpful to give them a couple days of cooler, less hot and sunny weather to get settled in before you get the 95 degrees and bright hot sunshine. Um, always plant late in the day. You wouldn't go out and plant something at 10 in the morning. You're better off planting at five or six at night. Water them really good and make sure they're watered every day until they get established. Uh, when's the best time to take perennial cuts for rooting? Keep them indoor in a low tunnel or in a low tunnel through the winter. Um, you always want to have fresh growth to root cuttings. It can be news growth in the spring or as long as the plant is still actively growing later in the season, you can still do it. You just don't, don't want woody stems or you know stems that are older. And you keep them indoor in a low tunnel through the winter. Um, if you've rooted them earlier in the spring and they're still in the plug tray, I would plant them in the ground where they're going to stay um, in September or early October. Um, other than that, you could put them in a low tunnel for the winter. If you're a warmer zone, you say you're zone seven, so you'd probably be fine to put them in a tunnel through the winter. But if they're in a tray, in a plug tray still, watch that water because they'll dry out fast. Um, so I must know to have a good source for shrubs. Unfortunately, ball color link doesn't really sell much in shrubs except for a few of the proven winter varieties through um, Four Star Greenhouse and there's another greenhouse company in New Hampshire. I can never remember the name. Um, other than that, I always recommend Google your state or your county and wholesale nursery. And you'd be surprised how many nurseries are in your neighborhood or in your area that you've never seen because they're often on some little backcountry road and they might have five acres of trees and shrubs are growing. You've just never know that they're there. Where I used to live in Maryland, there was a place called Sun Nursery that was about 20 miles west of Baltimore and they had everything you could imagine. They were open to the public, but they also sold wholesale. So as long as you had a business account with them, you got like it was 30% off the price they had and their prices were really good and nice big shrubs ready to go in the ground and some you could harvest on the first year. The other option, there's a place in Ohio called Willow Bend Nursery. They sell bare root shrubs shipped in the spring. You order them in advance, um, but they do have a high first order minimum of a, either $1,500 or $2,500, I forget which. But if you're growing a lot of trees and shrubs for cutting, they're a great source, great big plants that are really well-priced. the other direction. Never sure which direction to scroll on these questions. Uh, room for flowers. They're on their second flush of Lysianthus. If I cut them back, will they continue to bloom? Yes, they will continue to bloom until they freeze in the fall. Um, I knew somebody one time I had them in a tunnel and it still had gorgeous Lysianthus in Thanksgiving, in November, in Virginia. She was on her third and fourth flush. So as long as the plants are healthy, no disease problems, you keep them watered and fertilized, you can keep growing. But again, I don't like the, the idea of going back and cutting them back later. You want to do that cut back when you harvest that flower. Um, Lysianthers are kind of different because you can actually snap them just like a green bean. 
If you lean over, grab them right above the soil line and snap it, you've got the longest stem you can pick and you leave them behind a one inch stump that's gonna branch out and start branching out sooner than if you go back three, three weeks later and prune them all down at once. So I like to do that cut back when you do your harvest on each stem. Uh, this is a great question. Southern Bell Bloom Snow, can Lysianthus be overwintered in warmer clients, climates and ever treated as a perennial? Um, I wouldn't treat it so much as a perennial, but as more of a, a biennial, where I used to grow them in tunnel in zone seven, and I would always plan on overwintering them. I would harvest the flowers, get them to reflush in September and October, and then sometime in November when they stopped blooming, it's getting cold, I would go back and prune them all back then, and you would see a rosette of lots of nice fresh leaves at the ground level and little eyes, little sprouts ready to grow in the spring. And even if I lost a third of them over the winter from either not watering them enough or disease or animals or whatever, they put out so many flowers the next year, it was worth saving them even if you lost a third of them. So in zone, in the warmer zones, eight, nine, they were probably overwinter out in the field. Um, in a tunnel, zones five, maybe five, but definitely six and seven, you can overwinter them in a tunnel. The trick is they don't want to be soaking wet in the winter, so they got to have good drainage if they're outside in the zone eight or nine. Um, so raised beds are the best way to do it, but they will overwinter and come back amazing the next year. I don't see any more questions right here. Let me just scroll through again. A hunt country flowers must have lynchness and didiscus are cool flowers. I think the didiscus is. I'm not positive on that. I'd have to look in Lisa's The Cool Flower book. I don't think the lynchness is, but I'm not familiar with those two, if they're cold hardy or not. I think I answered all the questions. And it's 12.07, so I'm supposed to go for a half hour and I'm seven minutes over. So we'll call it a day. Um, I want to thank everybody. And next week... I'm not sure if Lisa's back or someone else is playing Lisa's part. Uh, but thanks for joining me today, and you all have a great day. Bye-bye.